will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Good afternoon and welcome to the, this hearing to review the state of plastics recycling technology in the United States. A warm welcome as well to our distinguished group of witnesses. This is going to be an informative and engaging panel and I'm looking forward to hearing your testimony. I'm also particularly excited to welcome Mr. Paul Sincock, a local leader from a city in my district, Michigan's 11th district, who has worked for the city of Plymouth for over 40 years. How special to have your leadership from southeastern Michigan here with us in the United States Capitol. Um, it has been a decade since the Science Committee last held a hearing on recycling and the challenges have only grown. During this hearing, we will examine recycling technologies and the technology gaps that prevent more of our plastics from being recycled, especially in light of China's new policy to ban the import of the most post-consumer recycled uh, recyclable materials, including plastics, which the U.S. and other developing countries have been shipping there for the past 25 years. While some businesses were selling China clean and well-sorted plastics, others were not. This was cited as a main reason for the ban. As we'll hear from Mr. Sincock, one of the things I've heard from local leaders in my district are the challenges they are facing in maintaining their recycling programs. As waste management companies are no longer able to sell recyclables to China, they are driving up their pricing to recoup costs costs that squarely fall on our municipalities and our taxpayers. In many cases, U.S. cities are being forced to cut, unfortunately, long-standing recycling programs and are instead incinerating recyclables or leaving them in landfills, releasing dangerous emissions. Americans who are trying to do the right thing, our consumers, for our environment are left unaware that their efforts are for naught. Yesterday, I wrote a letter to our EPA Administrator, Andrew Wheeler, to express my deep concern that the federal government is not doing more to build up our own recycling and waste management infrastructure to help cities and states with this newfound burden. I would like to, at this time, submit the letter for the record without objection. Plastic, most of which takes hundreds of years to break down naturally, has been a particular problem. We're seeing record amounts of plastic in our water system, including in our Great Lakes, because we don't have the process uh, to, to take on the volumes of, of waste that we are creating. Plastic is unquestionably convenient, and global production of plastic has soared from 2 million tons per year in 1950 to 400 million tons today. Most of our current U.S. recycling infrastructure is decades old and not built to process the amounts of plastic we have today. Likewise, our recycling policies haven't kept pace with today's plastic use. The last comprehensive federal law to improve recycling is the Research, Conservation, and Recovery Act of 1976, before I was born. The most recent publicly available EPA data on the economic impact of the recycling industry is from 2007. The Department of Commerce never acted on a 2007 GAO recommendation for the agency to develop a strategy to stimulate the development of domestic recycling markets. Instead, commerce activity, or actively, sought to build international markets. As a result, the U.S failed to invest in technology and materials to make the recycling process more efficient. This is a familiar story about crumbling infrastructure, lost industrial capacity, and lack of leadership. However, 
China's new policy, while in the short term puts us in crisis mode, should also be seen as an opportunity for the longer term, and we need to start now. Our response should be to reduce and reuse more, but it is not realistic to think we can give up disposable plastic altogether. We urgently need a national strategy to build out our country's recycling infrastructure. It is our opportunity to seize. At this time, we must continue to explore investment in research and development of sustainable materials and processes, as well as in standards. A concerted effort will make recycling more cost effective for our local governments while making it easier for the public to participate. In doing so, we can inspire a sustainable manufacturing and environment and above all, reduce emissions to keep our planet healthy. I greatly look forward to today's testimony and discussion. I hope it is just the beginning of this committee's efforts to contribute to smart solutions in our nation's recycling challenges. Thank you. And the chair now recognizes Mr. Brayard for an opening statement. Well, good afternoon, Chairwoman Stevens. And I appreciate uh, all of you being here with us to testify this afternoon. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have this hearing about emerging technologies and plastic recycling. In the 20th century, American scientists led the inventions of synthetic plastic materials. These discoveries were transformative for the first time in human manufacturing was not constrained by the limits of nature. The creation of plastic also made material wealth more widespread and attainable. Now in the 21st century, we must lead again in the development of new sustainable materials and recycling technologies. Investments in these key areas will ensure a better world for our children and our grandchildren. The plastics industry is one of the largest manufacturing sectors in the United States. The industry accounted for more than 430 billion in shipments and 989,000 jobs in 2017. My home state of Indiana was the highest concentration of plastics industry workers in the country producing nearly 20 billion in shipments. We have an opportunity to leverage that expertise, develop a new circular economy for the United States, and an economy that produces, recycles, and reuses materials to reduce cost and waste. We have witnesses today from government, academia, and industry who are working together on those very things to be able to advance them. I look forward to learning from the recycling challenges faced by our local communities and the new solutions, including chemical recycling and applying robotics and artificial intelligence to maintain sorting. Innovation in these areas will help the environment and the U.S. economy. We all want clean rivers, lakes, oceans, and healthier communities. What my constituents don't want are regulations that will raise the cost of energy, food production, construction, and technology. Costly regulations like those proposed in the Green New Deal would hurt middle and working class Americans the most. One of the wonderful things about the Science Committee is that we are not a regulatory committee. We are the committee of the future, looking to innovation and to solve problems. I'm looking forward to hearing from those potential solutions today for recycling plastic. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. The chair now recognizes the chairwoman of the full committee, Ms. Johnson, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman, and good afternoon to all. I want to thank you and the ranking member for putting together this panel to draw attention to the important issue before us, um, and welcome to our witnesses. Plastics have become fundamental to almost every aspect of our lives, from food storage to 3D printing technology, and have enabled us to make great technological advances. With this progress, however, comes a cost. Some estimates suggest that all Americans dispose of 22 million tons of products that could have been recycled every year. We produce far more plastic than we can properly recycle domestically and internationally. The extent of plastics pollution is becoming ever more apparent and more alarming. Just last week, a study found that over 90% of the river flood plains in Switzerland 
a country with one of the highest recycling rates in the world, were contaminated with microplastics. It is not just mountains and the soil which are subject to plastic contamination. We all have seen pictures of large masses of plastics floating in the oceans and washing up on the beaches around the world. A study in 2015 estimated that 8 million metric tons of plastic end up in the ocean every year. By some estimates, by mid-century, the oceans will contain more plastic waste than fish, ton for ton. While there is little research to date, we should be very concerned about the impact on human health of all this microplastic in our environment and our food chain. Complicating the challenge is China's ban on, on, on most imported recyclables. As a matter of fact, it's put a couple of businesses in my district out of business. Too many American communities are facing tough decisions about whether they will need to cut back on what they recycle, even whether they can recycle at all. The news is not all bleak, however. There are a number of promising new technologies and innovations across all steps of the recycling pathway, from collect collection to repurposing. These technologies are being developed through collaborations that span the life cycle of the material and include both public and private partners. The goals of these efforts are to increase the efficiency and availability of recycling, repurpose uh, more recycled plastics into high value products and ultimately reduce the impact on the environment and human health. These important efforts with a critical role for many of our federal science agencies as we will hear today. In conclusion, I want to echo uh, a comment by Chairman Stevens. As we look to improve recycling technologies, we must step up our efforts to reduce and reuse plastics through better technology and smarter incentives and policies. I look forward to today's discussion. I yield back to balance of my time. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. If there are any other members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I would like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Mr. Paul Sincock. Uh, Mr. Sincock is the city manager for the city of Plymouth, Michigan, uh, located in western Wayne County, Michigan. In this role, Mr. Sincock is the chief administrative officer of the city and is in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of the city and directs the city's efforts on recycling. Mr. Sincock also took the lead in implementing a pay-as-you-throw trash disposal system in the city and is a regular speaker on the topic of solid waste and recycling programs. He is also one of the first people who brought this problem to my attention. Um, our next witness is Dr. Govind Menon. Mr. Menon is the founding director of the School of Science and Technology and the chair of the Department of Chemistry and Physics at Troy University. In 2018, Dr. Menon received a $3.2 million grant from NIST one of the agencies that our subcommittee proudly has oversight over to help establish a Center for Materials and Manufacturing Sciences, which will focus on research into polymers and polymer recycling. Dr. Menon has a master's degree and a PhD from Troy University. After Dr. Menon is Dr. Greg Beckham. Dr. Beckham is a senior research fellow at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. He currently leads and works with an interdisciplinary team of biologists, chemists, and engineers at NARAL um, on conversions of biomass to chemicals and materials and in the area of plastics upcycling. He received his PhD in chemical engineering from MIT. 
Our final witness is Mr. Tim Boven. Mr. Boven is currently the Recycling Commercial Director for the Americas within Packaging and Specialty Plastics at Dow. He is responsible for developing new business models and growth strategies that monetize hard to recycle plastic streams in the Americas. Thank you for your leadership on that. This includes technologies to enhance mechanical recycling and chemical recycling technologies. He holds a BS in engineering from Western Michigan University and an MBA from Central Michigan University. As our witnesses should know, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel. At this time, we will start with the five-minute testimony from Mr. Sincock. Michael and get their materials in proper and acceptable format to the curb to allow our vendor to uh, collect and, and process that material. We have to be able to do this in a cost-effective manner. Uh, the current market situation um, does cause us some pause for concern uh, as we move forward on the viability of recycling because of the costs that are going. Without a viable end market for recyclable goods, the value of recycled goods simply goes down. The cost of collection, sorting, shipping, all must be factored into the municipal equation. When the value of collected recyclables goes down, municipal costs go up. When that happens, the local elected officials have the challenge of either increasing the cost of recycling programs and collections or eliminating parts of that program and potentially landfilling recyclable materials. In my home state of Michigan, recycling ranges from programs not offered to a countywide drop-off site to a regional drop-off site to municipal drop-off sites to curbside programs with a, a bucket or a bin to curbside programs, which, uh, which is what we use. It's commonly called a trash cart. Uh, you can put your recyclables in. If the cost of processing recycling goes up significantly, there may be a point from the municipal perspective where we are forced to make a choice on recycling or eliminating recycling uh, efforts due to costs. Partnerships are key in our program between government, our vendor, residents, and end users. For example, our vendor provides us with educational materials that we can use and adapt uh, as part of our program to uh, help educate our residents. From a technology standpoint, um, our solid waste and recycling collection program is pretty basic for our residents. Uh, we provide weekly pickup of solid waste and recyclables. They have, they have a brown cart for uh, uh, trash and they have a big 65-gallon uh, cart for, uh, for recycles as well. Our mission as a municipality is to help make sure that our residents understand what is acceptable and what is not acceptable as far as the recyclables go. Our municipality alone does not generate enough volume of materials needed to provide the sorting and recycling services at a cost-effective methodology. Fortunately, we're in a region where there's uh, large contractors and there, there is enough volume uh, to, to handle that. While recycling is the right thing to do, it is also a business, and we must be very aware of the business side of recycling. Some materials have limited end markets. Some materials are changing faster than the capital investment cycle to keep up with the changes, and perhaps future technology will allow us to expand end markets to keep up with the changes in materials. In our small Michigan municipality, it is our job, again, to educate our residents on an ongoing basis to ensure that the quality of our recycled goods is clean and acceptable. Municipalities across the country must have cost-effective uh, programs that allow our residents to easily recycle materials rather than throwing them in a landfill. At a minimum, it must be just as easy to recycle something as it is to throw something in the trash. 
Ideally, it would be easier for the homeowner or resident to recycle a product rather than throw it out. Thank you very much. And now we will hear from Dr. Menon. <clears throat> Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Baird, and the distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for including me in this discussion. Yeah. Let's just get your mic on. Hold on. Yeah. We, we want the world to hear you. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Baird, and the distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for including me in this discussion concerning the recycling of plastics. I've been asked today to talk about the recently established Center for Materials and Manufacturing Sciences at Troy University. But before I do so, let me begin with a few facts that will place a center such as ours in context. According to the EPA, currently the plastics recycling industry is operating below capacity with employment figures comparable with the U.S. automotive industry. Undoubtedly, an increase in supply will increase employment and capital investment. One of the issues facing the recycling industry is the practical limitations on the large-scale recyclability of the existing types of plastics available in the market. Simple factors like color, odor, strength, and malleability determine the value of recycled plastics. Additionally, environmental concerns behind the breaking down of plastic products loom the industry. Currently, there is over 200 billion pounds of plastic that can be shaped, extruded, or otherwise transformed into new products. However, at present, the recovery rate for all plastics in the United States is only about 9%. Of the two main plastics, PET and HDPE, high-density polyethylene, the United States has a recovery rate of roughly 30%. The need for more plastics recycling is made evident and undeniably provides a case for a dedicated center of research. The establishment of the Center for Materials and Manufacturing Sciences was made possible by a successful $3.2 million grant awarded by NIST. The center will serve as a fully integrated, multidisciplinary research facility that will bridge various majors and academic ranks. During the initial phase of establishing the center, one of the primary focuses will be on developing a state-of-the-art laboratory in polymer recycling. This major emphasis will aid to advance capabilities and offer support structure for local and national industries. In the long term, the center will help address plastics recycling from a holistic perspective, with complex issues of collecting, sorting, and cleaning with characterization. Moreover, the center will assist to engender a well-equipped next-generation workforce to these industries through appropriate course and program offerings. Students trained at the center will participate and be engaged in real life, real time industry projects. In order to glean the larger issues at stake, at its inception, the center hosted a road mapping session at the recent annual plastics recycling conference held here in Washington, DC. I will briefly discuss the three salient points raised by the nearly 200 attendees of the conference workshop. The primary issue facing the recycling industry is the supply of feedstock. If plastics recycling industry depended, uh, depended on the various states to supply their plant with recyclable feedstock, most plants could only run their facilities for a few days each year. The second largest issue facing the private sector is access to current technology. As the demand has continued to grow, there is an immediate need for resins with letters of non-objection from the FDA. Collection infrastructure, sorting technology, and resin chemistry is limited. A third and final issue that was raised during the workshop was related to the environmental impact of the recycling process. The point, is here, the point here is that the technologies developed must be flexible and incorporate universal utility because the market for material changes rapidly and materials available today may not be available the next week. Overall, the above questions make visible a significant lacuna in contemporary research in plastics recycling that can be effectively translated to sustainable goals in the industry. The center will focus on short, medium, and long-term issues to be resolved to negate these existing gaps. The specific projects will be carefully selected prioritized and undertaken in partnership with industry, community, and other stakeholders. 
the nearly zero carbon footprint technology of plastics recycling must be scaled up to meet the demands of global waste reduction. Ultimately, the Center for Materials and Manufacturing Sciences at Troy University will identify, develop, and implement solutions to the problems in contemporary plastics recycling by linking academia, industry, and community. Thank you. Dr. Beckman. Great. Uh, Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Baird, uh, and members of the subcommittee, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today to discuss the critical need for plastics recycling and upcycling uh, and how foundational science can contribute to this uh, and has the potential both to protect our nation's environment as well as strengthen the economy. Uh, so briefly today, what I'll address is, is primarily around two questions. One is, how do we deal with the plastics that we, that we generate today? And the second is, how do we make tomorrow's plastics recyclable by design? So plastics, as, as and certainly echoed in the opening remarks, are essential to modern life. We rely on them, and they, they have made our lives better. Uh, as we all know, though, they're choking our world's oceans, they're killing aquatic and terrestrial life, they're in the air we breathe, and the food that we eat. Uh, and certainly, uh, re reducing individual plastic use must be part of the solution, uh, but plastics should not be demonized. On top of this, today's recycling industry, from my perspective, uh, being mostly mechanical in nature, is a downcycling uh, sort of operation. When you put this PET bottle into the recycling bin, if it is recycled, it's much lower in value because its material properties are compromised. And it will tend to go to things that are lower value, like carpet or clothing, which still ultimately end up in the landfill. And so there's a very little, in my opinion, very little economic incentive now to do uh, plastics recycling with the current uh, paradigms we use. Of course, we all know that China has recently banned the imports of plastic waste as well, which is causing massive stress on existing domestic recycling. And so we need to think uh, beyond today's recycling paradigm. And our ultimate goal, as again was echoed in the opening statements, uh, is to develop uh, foundational science that can transition us from a linear flow-through economy where this is sourced from petroleum and put into the trash uh, or the recycling bin and likely is still not recycled but downcycled to an economy that is circular such that this material could stay in, in continuous use. And to this end, chemical recycling or the use of catalysts, microbes, or enzymes to break down plastics into building blocks and then build them back up into new virgin-like materials offers a more sustainable, innovative, and, and I think profitable approach around which we can completely rebuild and rethink the American recycling industry. Plastics breakdown is very similar to the, to the breakdown of waste plant material, like agricultural residues that you would find from corn, for example. Uh, plastics are distributed just like biomass is. They're costly to recover just like biomass. They're also incredibly durable and hard to break down, just like cellulose is. It's the reason why cows need four stomachs and we don't get any caloric value from celery, for example. Uh, the advent of a lignocellulosic-based economy, uh, as all of you know, required sustained investment in science and engineering and technology. And over the last 40 years, there have been massive gains in the viability of biomass conversion such that the United States and the world, I think, is on the cusp of utilizing biomass for uh, renewable fuels, chemicals, and materials. Dealing with plastics, just like with biomass, will require sustained commitment to develop these viable processes. One obvious option in, in the case of chemical recycling is to take this PET bottle and convert it back into a PET bottle that has the same properties. So you can break it down using chemical catalysts or enzymes, break it down into its building blocks, and put it back into another bottle like this. Conversely, and I think more interestingly, there's a potential for um, this concept of plastics upcycling. So put this into the recycle bin, break it down into building blocks, and then put it into something that's much longer lifetime and much higher value. For example, this PET bottle can be turned into a car part that will go into a composite material in a car. It can go into a wind turbine. It can be made into Kevlar. It can be made into other things like this. This idea of upcycling or the creation of more, of more valuable product from waste material, I think will incentivize the economics of plastics reclamation, which is really what we ultimately need. And examples like this need to be developed to help stem the flow of plastics into the environment and into the landfills. Secondly, today, most plastics are made from petroleum-based building blocks with recycling as an afterthought. This is, of course, unsustainable. Foundational science in the last decade or so, especially funded in the United States, has, been, has demonstrated an accessible bio-based building block portfolio around which we can source new materials to make bio-based plastics. At the same time that we're building new plastics, we need to think about how they can be recyclable, so recyclable by design at the end of their life. And in this, certainly, uh, with thinking about these redesigning new materials from bio-based resources, we should inherently design these materials to be recyclable at the end of their lifetime. In summary, certainly more research is urgently needed in the concepts of plastics upcycling and enabling recyclable by design plastics. In the, blue, in the last episode of the Blue Planet 2, uh, which some of you may have seen, uh, Sir David Attenborough remarked, 
quote, we are at a unique stage in our history. Never before have we had such an awareness of what we're doing to the planet, and never before have we had the power to do something about that. Surely we have a responsibility to care for our blue planet, the future of humanity, and indeed all life on Earth now depends on us. He was talking about the plastics problem in this case. So in my opinion, dedicated, aggressive, and federally supportive R&D investment that harnesses the innovation of the U.S. research community must be brought to bear to deal with today's plastics through the development of chemical recycling of today's plastics, as well as thinking about how to, be, how to make tomorrow's plastics recyclable by design. Developing processes that can achieve this economic viability uh, should enable the creation of a completely new industry in the United States and enable millions of jobs. Thank you. Mr. Bowman. Chairwoman Stevens, Ranking Member Baird, members of the subcommittee, it's my privilege to address you on the topic of closing the loop, emerging technologies and plastic recycling. My name is Tim Bolvin. I am the Recycling Commercial Director at Dow in our packaging, especially plastics business. My organization is responsible for business solutions that enable a circular economy. Right now, what's been said, we live in a primarily a linear economy where the goods we use every day are manufactured from raw materials, sold, used, and then discarded. Applying the principles of circular economy will us allow us to optimize resources to minimize the extraction of new raw materials and ultimately reduce the amount of waste going to landfills. Recycling is foundational for circularity, and it's good for the economy. Investment in mechanical and chemical recycling will spur domestic investment supporting business growth. If widely adopted, advanced recycling processes could result in growth in new U.S. jobs and economic output. Dow believes plastics are too valuable to be lost as waste, and as such, innovation is needed to retain its value. Plastic provide many benefits to society, including reducing food waste, improving energy efficiency, reducing material usage, and improving functionality. What society needs and where the industry is now focusing is on effective recycling solutions that retain the value of plastic after its initial use. Collection is a key step in the recycling process. If the material is not collected effectively, it cannot be recycled. The U.S. recycling system is highly fragmented and variable, resulting in unequal access and confusion. The challenge equates to high contamination levels, excuse me, <coughs> high contamination levels in collected recycling. Much of the U.S. has a single stream collection with sorting left to material recovery facilities, or MRFs. Many MRFs are privately owned and their capabilities vary widely. Most were designed for paper, glass, and metal. Technology and process improvements are needed in this space to improve the quality and consistency of the plastic coming from these facilities. Once we have collected it, we can recycle it. Plastics can often be much more challenging to recycle than other materials because of its low density and wide range of plastics collected, which may be incompatible. Innovation is needed to improve the ability of equipment to sort and process hard to recycle materials. Two terms commonly used to describe plastic recycling are mechanical recycling and chemical or feedstock recycling. Traditional mechanical recycling is an excellent first step in getting the value from used plastic and has environmental benefits. However, mechanical recycling has a significant limitation in the end product performance and is only suitable for a limited number of high volume applications. It is extremely difficult to remove all the contaminants, such as dirt, inks, fibers, adhesives, etc. All are included in the recycling stream, all impact performance. Dow is supporting innovation in mechanical recycling through application development, high performance material development, allowing for the incorporation of PCR, compatibilization technology to minimize contamination. Even with these advances, mechanical recycling of all plastics is a significant challenge, particularly in high-end applications like those that require FDA approval. These challenges require innovation that cannot be addressed with processes like feedstock recycling. Feedstock recycling is an advanced recycling process of depolymerizing a plastic back to its original building box where it can be then introduced into the front end of the polymer manufacturing process. This process is very similar to paper recycling where it's taken back to fiber. Feedstock recycling has the potential to produce recycled plastic with virgin-like performance capable of being used in the most stringent applications. Dow is actively researching plastic conversion processes of pyrolysis and gasification. We have projects ranging from process technology through the effective conversion to plastic. Increasing recycling rates and expanding the materials collected will not happen on its own, and there are important steps Congress can take to enable growth in this sector. This includes support on uniform definitions on recycling so that new technology is not precluded, standards for mass balance accounting to certify recycled plastic content, recycling infrastructure funding, and the support and the development of new end markets for recycled plastic. 
I've expanded on these topics in my written statement. In conclusion, thank you for your time and the opportunity to testify on this important topic. We believe the public and private sectors can partner together to advance innovation and accelerate recycling. Dow looks forward to working with Congress on these issues and answering any questions the committee may have. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, we are going to begin our first round of questions, and the chair is going to recognize herself for five minutes. Uh, undoubtedly, where we uh, see challenge and identify challenge as a nation, we readily want to turn that challenge into opportunity, and that is something that I heard from all of you in your scope of work and in your testimony. Uh, Mr. Sencock, I'd like to just drill down for a minute with you. Since uh, these new changes from China have been implemented, could you just explain a little bit about what our small town of Plymouth, the city of Plymouth, has been experiencing with its recycling? Oh, certainly, the uh, city of Plymouth, uh, we have been, we're right towards the end of a, our contract with our uh, solid waste and recycling hauler. So we've been okay at this point. But several of our neighboring communities, uh, you know, we all talk um, and are feeling the pinch and, um, you know, we have also had our contractor come to us and say, look, recycling costs are going up. We need more help. We need you to uh, take a look at, uh, you know, perhaps amending our contract, those kinds of issues. So we're seeing that there's more issues with the recycling, especially plastics, um, and trying to make sure that our residents uh, are able to still have a program that is viable from a, you know, an operational standpoint, you know, that's not cost prohibitive. And that's really where the, where the tends to be the trend is going at this point, uh, is, is significant cost increases uh, from our haulers and, and recyclers uh, related to the product. And that obviously passes down to, to our residents. And as you have spent time educating the public on the, the benefits of recycling or encouraging them to recycle, what challenges have you run into? What things have you seen have worked best in terms of recycling campaigns? And have you started to hear about this fear of, of cost? Well, certainly one of the things, the big challenges is, is that we have is, do we back our recycling programs down? You know, we've spent so much time and effort building up the recycling programs. You know, our community has very high and impressive rates of, of recycling um, in, in Wayne County. Uh, but it also becomes a, an issue for our residents if we are going to back down from the, the really good programs that we currently have and the amount of education that we've put into it. And it's a hard sell at the municipal level that I call it the reach out and touch me level of government, um, where, what do you mean we're not recycling whatever the product may be? Uh, that's a hard, difficult conversation to have with our residents. Do you see a revenue uh, opportunity for the city in recycling or, uh, you know, continuing to build out your programs and as there ways that the federal government can help you to meet those goals? Well, I think what the, the issue is on the revenue side is, and it depends on the municipality, our particular contract, we wanted to stay out of the, the swings in the market. Um, so in our particular case, the vendor takes all of the risk as to market upside and market downside. So we're not affected. Our price stays constant. Now, we don't get the benefit of, you know, when recycling, you know, markets go up and the contractor gets to receive some benefits there. But um, on the flip side of that, we don't have to deal with the downside. And so that's, uh, you know, other municipalities get, they split the, uh, the value of the recycles. Um, between the vendor and the community. The community will get a small percentage of, of the recyclables. But as the market goes down, that percentage goes down to near zero or less than zero. 
we have our storied traditions and best practices in Michigan with our recycling programs and our buyback programs. I think it's it's evident that there are, are certainly uh, opportunities and revenue opportunities as well as sincere environmental considerations for us to meet. And yet the onus is on our consumers and it's on our taxpayers and it's sort of reliant on the altruism of our, our, of our residents to recycle and to not throw, I, I, I commend all of you who talked about the greasy pizza box in your testimony, because at least two of you did. Uh, but it, in terms of how we're stymied or how uh, we can meet some of our bigger goals and some economic opportunities, I, you know, I commend our last two uh, witnesses for mentioning the circular economy and what that means for us and how in sync we really are. Um, I'm out of time, so I, I'm good, just going to conclude with one of the results that uh, we want to take from this hearing is identifying federal opportunity to partner with you in your respective uh, fields and, and uh, portfolios of work to lead to uh, increased recycling, meeting environmental goals, as well as economic opportunity based on technological advancement. And with that, I'm going to recognize my colleague, Mr. Brigard, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Bowman, uh, the subway plant in Lafayette, Indiana, uh, which is in my district, has been a zero landfill facility since 2004, and that reflects a commitment by the company to have as little in environmental impact as possible. Uh, can you elaborate uh, for me what Dow and the plastics industry in general uh, has been doing to work with um, the front end sustainability idea and not just the back end sustainability in, the, in producing products? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Congressman. So at Dow, I can speak specifically. We've had a series of 10 year sustainability goals now, and we're in our third generation of those that go out through 2025. And the sustainability goals that we have at our company are really around defining blueprints for designing sustainability into the future. So when you talk about plastic circularity in, in particular, a big initiative that we're very involved with is design for recyclability. How do we help our customers? How do we help the marketplace design products that can be recycled in the end? Today, a lot of packaging, as an example, has gone to very complex structures which create problems for the recycling industry. And so what we're working with them on is all polyethylene type structures, as an example. And the reason we're doing that is because polyethylene is one of the largest collected plastics today. So if we can get more materials into common materials that can be collected, that can help with increasing plastic recovery and plastic recycling. This is one example. We have a lot of initiatives, uh, material science in terms of increasing resins that can incorporate recycled content, as well as end market. We're working on new market applications so we can create new large volume applications to create these markets that people say don't exist. This is where we're spending a lot of our time. Thank you. And uh, continuing on in that same vein, um, in your testimony, you discussed the benefits of chemical recycling. Uh, what's needed to scale up and bring down the cost of chemical recycling and make it more viable in the United States, do you think? Very good question. One of the things that we're looking at aggressively is how do we address that very topic of scale? When you look at the petrochemical industry today, it's been capitalized around very large fossil fuel deposits. When you talk about using plastic as a feedstock, plastic is everywhere. So a significant challenge that we're working through and trying to under, under, address with value chain partners is how do we aggregate plastic and bring it to a central location so we can get the appropriate amount of feedstock to build the appropriate scale we need to be meaningfully effective. At the same time, we're working on the capital intensity equation to try to bring down the capital intensity per metric ton of product produced so we can put feedstock recycling Locate it where the feedstock is, in this case, waste plastic. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, if I got time, I think. Uh, Dow and the other companies uh, are investing heavily in new sustainable material and in recycling technologies. Uh, what's the market incentive for industry to invest in that kind of in, in research in that 
in that area? Well, quite frankly, society is demanding it. The plastic waste issue, you can't turn on the television, you can't go to the internet without seeing it. And society wants solutions to this. So we look at this as, yes, it's a big challenge, but it can be an opportunity for those who want to make those investments today and work towards addressing the problem of the future. So this is how we see it. It's going to be absolute, and it's where we're putting a lot of time and effort. Thank you. One last question, if you will. Sure. Uh, how would uh, developing standards for plastic materials and recycling help advance the industry in the United States and maintain America's leadership in that field? St standards in what regard? Uh, I was thinking about any of the any of the things that relate to um, uh, regulation of, of the plastics or the quality of the plastics. Yeah, thank you. And so on. So one thing that will help certainly is to create definitions around what recycling is. Today, when we look at what uh, people want and require, it's high end recycled material. That's not going to be possible without advanced recycling technologies. Today, there is no universal definition of recycling. And as we look to bring forward new technologies, we want to make sure that technologies like pyrolysis, gasification, subolysis, those types of processes are included in the definition of recycling. And this would be increasingly important as people look to put policy around. We know there's states that are having these discussions, and if they start putting policy around recycling targets, definitions will follow. And we want to ensure that there's broad definitions that don't preclude technology. Thank you very much, and uh, I yield back my time. The chair now recognizes Mr. McAdams for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for convening this timely and important hearing. And thank you, Mr. Sinek, uh, Dr. Menon, Dr. Beckham, and Mr. Boven for your testimony here today. In my previous role, I was the mayor of Salt Lake County, and I worked to enhance, enhance our waste management practices to achieve our environmental goals, and it often aligned with our fiscal objectives. We found that they were often the same thing. Um, whether collecting green waste to break down and resell or capturing methane, uh, methane leakage for energy generation at our landfill, technologies made our waste management greener, smarter, and less costly to taxpayers. So I'm excited today to have the opportunity to discuss how we can make use of new and forthcoming technologies to make our plastic sorting, management, and recycling more effective and profitable in recycle and upcycle applications. We've also seen some of the challenges as, as uh, global interest in some, in some of recycling has waned. And so um, my first question is for you, Mr. Sinek. As boots on the ground in your town, what's been the most effective tool that you've used to help residents to improve their recycling practices, their individual practices? Education, uh, and it's ongoing and multifaceted. So it's, it's mailers to the home, it's stickers on the, on the trash carts, it's uh, social media. All of those things are a critical element to ensuring that the plastics industry has a quality product uh, to deal with. And um, what's the most common request or complaint that your community voices about your recycling program, or, and what have you done to remedy any concerns that were raised? The most common complaint is that we don't recycle enough, yeah. uh, and that you know it becomes a challenge as to how do we have a product that somebody else is going to use. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Dr. Beckham, in your testimony, you said that recycling alone can save 40 to 90% of the inherent uh, energy in plastics relative to the pr production of new plastics. Does this apply to both chemical and mechanical recycling? Uh, most of those statistics uh, were currently um, obtained in the context of standard uh, today's mechanical recycling. Do we, do we have good estimates for potential energy savings using chemical recycling? Right. I think um, judicious um, life cycle assessment, technoeconomic analysis, as, as well as, um, yeah, just generally uh, uh, supply chain energy analyses uh, are forthcoming. Uh, we have looked at, for example, PET upcycling, for example, using chemistry to composite materials and they have shown over standard composites manufacturing can save up to 60% of the supply chain energy and reduce greenhouse gas emissions quite considerably as well. It's promising. Dr. Menon, what technologies could help us, uh, sim could help to, um, simply to simple decision, simplify decision-making for Americans as they sort their waste into trash or bin recycling every day? And 
um, maybe that's generally is a question, but I've also, there have been some experimental technologies that I've heard about or um, haven't had the opportunity to actually witness them, but about single streaming, both waste and recycling, um, and your thoughts on that. In terms of, uh, in terms of technology, uh, the real issue is access to technology. Uh, it's one thing for academia to have instrumentation. <laughs> It's another thing entirely for recycling facilities to have uh, instrumentation. So perhaps one of the things uh, that we should look into, particularly from the point of view of academia, is to make technology affordable. Can we reinvent instrumentation that is more affordable and more accessible? Um, uh, recycling companies make uh, pennies to a pound. So every dollar, every, every pound of recycling material matters. So they, they're not able to invest necessarily into uh, technology. So the, maybe a new generation of affordable technology is what we're thinking of at this point, r rather than reinventing technology as well. But uh, as was mentioned by Dr. Beckham, uh, of course, chemical recycling is... Mm -hmm. It's virgin territory in terms of large-scale recyclability. Mm -hmm. So that is something we would be considering as well. So I guess my question to all of you, I'm about out of time, but what infrastructure are we lacking as a country? What And what can we do to, as a Congress to further incentivize these investments in, in R&D and then deployment of technology? Well, I think uh, the issue for, for us at the local municipal level is where's the end product and is there a, a use? And then how do we cost-effectively collect that material? And you know, mixing it into a, a single stream is interesting. I mean, I've seen the technology as a mayor. It was troubling to me because I was uh, the technology's there. My 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 concern was: is it viable? And and experimenting with that, do we lose all the ground we've gained with educating our consumers on on sorting to go single stream to then have it fail, and we've just lost exactly. Yeah. Thank you. I yield back. The chair uh, now recognizes uh, Mr. Balderson for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, this question goes to Dr. Menon and uh, Mr. Boven. Uh, I had a question for all of you, but the gentleman down there took my question. So uh, currently municipalities set their own recycling standards depending on what the, on what the facility in the area is capable of processing. They can vary widely from city to city, depending upon the local infrastructure. Dr. Menon, you touched on NIST efforts to create processing standards in this pay space. Recently, your university, as you stated, uh, received a grant to work on expanding this. While I understand the draw towards this, I remain concerned that the federal government is not best suited to achieve this goal. Ensuring that recycling plants across the country have the same processing abilities however, would lessen the amount of plastic that needs to be exported for processing. Could you speak about what you have found in your research uh, on this subject? Thank you very much for the question. I do believe NIST is the right agency. Uh, in particular, we don't have a universal standard when it comes to recycling plastics. If you look at uh, the resin identification code, the, the numbers one through seven, it tells you the polymer content in, in, a, in a bottle. It doesn't tell you anything about the contaminants, nor does it tell you how to recycle the, the, the product. So setting these standards is, an, is a game changer when it comes to recycling. And, and setting standards is what NIST does. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bevan, are the suggestions that Dr. Minnan offered something that Dow could see working in the marketplace? Yes, thank you for the question. Yeah, the answer is yes. In fact, there's uh, the, Sust the Sustainable Packaging Coalition where that group has already developed and working towards developing recycling standards for packagers to put on their labels, both paper and plastic, the how-to recycle label. And it gives implicit instructions to consumers on the packages they buy on how to, to recycle it, whether it be not recyclable or store drop-off. Those types of instructions are put on that. That's a first step, and that is working at cleaning up the recycling streams today. Because one of the issues is you have wish cyclers who put everything in their single bin collection system, which actually creates a lot of problems for the MRFs, and you have a lot of rejected material because of that. So it starts with cleaning up what goes into the recycling bins first. Okay. 
Thank you very much. I yield back my remaining time, Madam Chair. Fabulous. Um, the Chair would now like to recognize um, Mr. Foster for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to our witnesses. Um, let's see, most of the talk so far has been on uh, on thermoplastics, uh, PET and um, polyethylene. Uh, are, are thermosets and cross-linked plastics pretty much a lost cause for recycling, or are there enzymatic systems that may depolymerize them and allow them to be recycled? So I'll, I'll take that. So um, thermosets uh, today uh, are indeed very challenging to recycle because it's hard to get them to flow in the context of the mechanical and thermal recycling paradigms we have now. Thinking forward to uh, recyclability by design, there's a, an emerging field in polymer science uh, around this concept of vitrimers where you have uh, cross links that are able to be chemically broken down. So you would imagine taking a thermoset, a composite material, dumping it in, for example, into acid and breaking that down into flowable polymers again. There's an enormous opportunity here for recycling a wind turbine blade, which is a cross-linked thermoset, which we can't do right now. We grind it up and put most of it into the landfill or burn it. But I think emerging chemistries for recyclability by design for composite materials that would go into a wind turbine or a car or a snowboard or whatever have enormous potential. So, And do structural fibers that are, you know, carbon fibers or other fibers put in, are those make life really rough for recycling as well? Anybody else want to take a minute? Okay. Um, certainly, uh, traditional polyacrylonitrile carbon fiber today is very challenging from a recyclability perspective. Again, mostly it's thermal energy recovery is, is, is sort of the place that's routed to. There are emerging chemistries uh, from the academic community and, and generally the U.S. research community on ways to break down polyacrylonitrile-based carbon fiber, uh, but that's incredibly challenging. So again, I think we need to rethink how we're putting those carbon fibers together and think about recyclability by design as well as lifetime performance. With new so by, by the thermal, you mean that is uh, pyrolysis and gasification, what you're saying? As well as just simply burning it for energy recovery in some cases. Okay. Yep. And, and um, actually, uh, Mr. Bowman, you mentioned in addition to pyrolysis and gasification, something that sounded like subolysis or something. What was, that's not something I'm familiar with. Yeah, subolysis. So subolysis is a solvent-based process. It's commonly used for PET and nylon. Those polymer architectures are well suited for that, where you can use a solvent to break it down into monomer, and then you can build it back up. Okay, all right. So it's a it's solvent. Got it. Understand. I think I used to do that with... Um, Styrofoam and model airplane glue, as a, as a child. <laughs> see, look at there's a lot of common experience in that. The first time you tried to do that and it didn't end well. Um, so, uh, so what fraction then of the uh, of the current plastic production stream are easy targets like um, uh, PET and high density polyethylene? Is that 80% of the plastics production that are things we ought to be able to recycle, or are there just a million small uh, streams that will all each have to be dealt with? Well, polyolefins are, polyolefins being generically polypropylene, polyethylene, are the largest polymer family used in packaging type applications, non-durable applications. Applications that have a life that's less than, say, a year. And, and those are the, the targeted where we should put a lot of effort in recycling and recovery, and they have large end markets as well. So if you can recover those material, you have the opportunity to recycle those and find homes for them. Right, and but is that 50% uh, of plastic production or, or just another 20% hunk? No, it, I, I'd have to get back with you, sir, on that exact okay. question, but those two polymer families are the largest. It's directionally just south of 50% are polyolefin type materials. Okay, and um, now according to Wikipedia, if you look at, at polyethylene terephthalate, uh, a majority goes into fibers. Uh, and so, is it how do you recycle fibers if someone makes you know a Decron shirt or something like this? Are you really going to recycle that? And they, they, the number in Wikipedia was above fifty percent going into fibers. And is that is that a whole separate struggle to even collect it in in a pure stream? The challenge there is collection of textiles. Yeah, you have to collect it, and then you would have to put it in some sort of chemical recycling process to effectively recycle it. Right, and these are often mixed with cotton and so on, and so it's a difficulty. Are there any plausible ways to make that happen, to recycle clothes that are made with multiple fibers? 
so chemical recycling, feedstock recycling has the opportunity, depending on the technology route that you, that you take. Uh, gasification, as an example, is a, is a technology route that can take any organic material. So it can be biomass, it can be fiber, it can be plastic, you can put it in there. That will break it down to fundamental syngas. And then from syngas, we can do lots of different things with it. Yep. If I can just add one thing in terms of um, PET mixed with cotton, which is a lot of polyester clothing, right? I mean, enzymatic processes are exquisitely selective to go in and break both the ester bonds in PET as well as the ether bonds in cellulose or cotton to make sugars and mixtures of these building blocks of PET. So I think there's a lot of potential there as well. Okay, uh, thank you, and I yield back. Um, the chair now recognizes Mr. Gonzalez for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, witnesses, for being here today. I uh, first want to use this time to recognize the University of Akron's College of Polymer Science and Polymer Engineering, which is recognized as being one of the world's best in the polymer sciences. University also does great work getting young students excited about the polymer sciences through their Akron Global Polymer Academy, which provides opportunities for teachers and students of all ages to experience the world of polymers by organizing in-school visits and field trips to the university's research facilities. Uh, they're doing a fantastic job. Uh, polymer research and development has been huge in Northeast Ohio, where I'm from, um, for, for my entire life and, and before it, um, and so we're proud of that. Um, I want to take my time to, to really just understand this a little bit better, frankly. Um, and my first question will be to Mr. Bovin. I'll, I'll probably stay with you if that's okay. Um, I, I first want to understand the interplay between mechanical and chemical uh, in the constant context of the circular economy. It strikes me as I read your testimony that chemical is probably how we get there ultimately. I'm sure there, there's a role, obviously a role for mechanical, but can you just kind of walk me through that for a second? Yeah, sure. Thank you for the question. So when you look at the relate, there is a relationship between mechanical and chemical recycling in the sense that we would suggest that if it can be mechanically recycled, it should be. It should be because there's a lower carbon footprint. It's not as energy intensive and it can be deployed locally, right? You can do mechanical recycling at a very local level very effectively. The challenge with mechanical recycling has always been finding end markets because right. you will have some polymer degradation. Products that cannot be introduced into the mechanical recycling system effectively are the products that should go into chemical recycling. Because at that route, you can address the contamination issues that come. And in fact, when you talk about MRFs today, on average, about 25 to 30 percent of the material going into a MRF is actually rejected because it's okay. too highly contaminated to be processed. You can feed that into a chemical recycling process to then recycle the, the product. Thank you. And then um, my second question, uh, when it comes to, to chemical recycling, um, if I'm going to score these 1, 5, and 10. So if, if 1 is sort of we understand what needs to happen, but we haven't really started developing, 5 is our tech is viable, but we need to define business models to get it deployed more in the market. And then 10 is we understand the tech, we understand the business model, we just need to deploy and scale. Where are we on chemical manufacturing? I would put us at a five, quite frankly. Okay. Okay. When we're talking about chemical manufacturing, we're talking about mature technologies like gasification pyrolysis. They've been around for a long time. They have not been used uh, widely for the purpose of recycling plastic. And so we're talking about putting a value chain together and different partners together to aggregate the plastic to get it to a chemical recycling facility. From there, you turn it into an intermediate, and then you have to integrate it into the current petrochemical industry. Okay. So, we so, have to work on the business model side. Okay, so it's a combination of business model. Once we get there, then we can scale it. Um, my last one, and I, I kind of hate to go here, but these paper straws, um, they are my pet peeve. <laughs> they, I, I took my son the other day to get a milkshake. He's one years old. Uh, we do this on Saturdays. Paper straw shows up. The thing disintegrates before we're a third of the way through. Uh, he's also throwing uh, whipped cream at my face. So, um, you know, all kinds of things going on there. Um, it, it, I personally <laughs> despise them. Uh, on top of that, only 0.025% of plastic that's flowing into the ocean uh, is straws, plastic straws. Um, they also require more energy to use or to, to manufacture um, than plastics. Um, so I kind of want to just have you give me some hope um, that, that maybe Dow is, is working on uh, either new technologies, new bioplastics um, that are more efficient and, and better for the environment. Um, or that we're making progress on the sortability, because my understanding is the reason why it's hard to recycle plastic straws is because it's hard to sort them. Um, so give me some hope, please. Yeah, we should take hope. There is hope, and I yeah. say that because 
plastic pollution is now widely accepted across the world. And you see collaboration happening across the value chain that hasn't happened, uh, at least in my 22 years in the plastic industry. You see industry partners coming together, making investments like the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, where over a billion dollars has been committed to fund solutions to drive uh, plastic, the ending of plastic waste. Now, is a billion dollars enough? I know a billion dollars is a great start, and we expect it to continue to grow. Uh, when you talk about biodegradability or bio-based plastics, those are two very different things. We think the focus needs to be on investing in infrastructure to recover the plastic and retain its value. That's where we're spending a uh, majority of our time, and we don't want to get distracted with other things that aren't going to have a meaningful impact. Okay, thank you, and I yield back. Looks like we'll be calling the TNI committee after this hearing, uh, based on the, those repeated claims. Um, the chair uh, is now going to recognize Mr. Cohen for five minutes. Thank you. Good news for your son. A gift you can get him, and I would get him if, you, if, if I should get him and present to you, is you can buy steel straws, and he'll have his own straw to, to get his milkshake out of, and it'll be real cold when it comes up, which is a nice feeling. Plastic does not give you that nice feeling, but a cold steel straw is a very attractive thing. On the internet, you can get them a set of 20 for $9.99, wholesale, Amazon.com. Mr. Cohen, his birthday was two weeks ago. Oh, wow. We accept. We accept. Would he still, still accept gifts? Oh, absolutely. Good. <laughs> well, I will get him one. Thank get you. Him a, a set. Uh, I've got a friend in Los Angeles who's bigger than the Anti-Plastics Coalition, uh, De Deanna Cohen, no relation, and she's given me steel straws. And uh, I don't use straws that much, but when I do, I find a great sense of uh, tactical, you know, s pleasure out of using that steel straw, which I never got out of a plastic straw, or certainly not a paper straw. So this is a whole new day for everybody, really. Now, I would like to ask Mr. Uh, is it Boven? Last year, I had a bill which passed the House that said we would not use plastic straws in the uh, cafeterias, and it passed. But it passed over the objections of uh, Dow Chemical, I think. Uh, there was a congressman from, that worked for Dow, represented Dow, et cetera, got a lot of money from Dow, and he worked against it and got, wanted to get water it down. Why can't Dow come up with something that is uh, uh, good for the environment rather than things that are bad for the environment and work against us making the environment better? Congressman, thank you for your question. I'm sure your thank you is not what you really meant, but thank you for saying that. <laughs> I'm not an expert in the policy side or familiar with the discussion that you're talking about, but we can have our D.C. office get back to you and address that question. Well, that'd be all right, I guess. But, you know, we, I, I, don't, I think we're changing our policies, and we ought to be changed. Like right now, there's a whole bunch of plastic bottles with water out there. We really shouldn't be using plastic bottles with water. And I brought it in, and all of a sudden I thought, what are we doing? Now, we've got these cups here. This is great. But we ought to be carrying around our own and pouring water into them from the sink. Potomac water is fine. I second that motion. <laughs> and, and exactly. Good work, Brad. And, and just not using plastic as much as we can. It's, it's reduce, recycle, and reuse. Well, reduce, and that's what you, we got to do because it is getting in the water, and animals are, are dying. That, you know, they, they found whales with tons of plastic in their gut, and they think it related to their deaths, and there's all kind of sea life that is being uh, just killed because of plastic pollutions in, in, the, in, in, in the oceans. So we need to stop using plastic as much as we can. Uh, Dr. Menon, do you have any ideas on how we can you know, maybe create or use paper, uh, something else, anything other than plastic? I don't know this is made of plastic, but this is reuse. Mr. Cohen, thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, I do not offhand know of a material that would replace plastic so easily. It exists because of the availability, the ease, and all, all the versatility. So it is not easily replaced. Uh, but maybe there are plant fiber solutions in, we could uh, think of uh, that would be easier to uh, a, at least degrade easily. But I, I would like to uh, make a comment regarding uh, one of the statements you made. So in, in the Mariana Trench, which is deeper than um, Everest is tall, every animal species found 
had plastic in their guts. So this is where we are when it comes to plastics recycling. And plastics recycling in the ocean, that's an entirely different, I mean, so that, that's an impossible task. It shouldn't get there in the first place. Yeah, well, we need to find a way to re reuse or reduce our use of plastics and then reuse whenever possible. And recycling is great, and I recycle everything I can, and I hope Memphis does a good job on it. But, uh, you know, it's just a, a different. Today I went and I'm very proud of what I did today because I've been obsessing on it. Uh, these glasses, eyeglasses, I like them a lot, and I've had them for a long time. And I got them to replace a pair of sunglasses I had that I really loved. And they were American Optical Saratogas, which were the same glasses that John Kennedy wore, sunglasses. And so John Kennedy wore them, I wore them. You know, he was in the house, I'm in the house. That's as far as it goes. Uh, and my sunglasses, I br broke them about 15 years ago, I think. And, uh, and, and then I broke these about three weeks or a month ago. Everybody in the world tells you you can't repair plastic. It's impossible. It's done. Well, I'd saved those glasses from 15 years ago, and these I had. And I took them to a guy up here at 750 17th, and he fixed both pair of glasses. You can't see the, the, that they were broken, and these were broken in two different places. $70, they're back together. Reuse your plastic frames. Don't buy new ones, get them redone. 750 17th Avenue, right opposite the executive office building. Great deal. And with that, I want to say I love the graduate, but plastics, no. <laughs> All right, the chair is now going to recognize uh, Mr. Sherman for five minutes. Thank you. And Thank you for holding these hearings and bringing them uh, to my particular attention. Um, the gentleman from Tennessee focuses us not only on reduce, reuse, and recycle, but also repair. Uh, so the fourth R, but once you get through all four R's, uh, there's a reason why we prefer, from an environmental standpoint, paper straws to plastic straws, and that is the paper's biodegradable. How close are we to developing plastic products that have the advantages of plastic, uh, the, pretty much the cost of plastic, but are in fact biodegradable? Uh, Mr. Bowen? You guys anywhere close to that? Biodegradable, biodegradable plastics do exist today, PLAs as an example. Biodegradable plastics present serious challenges to today's recycling infrastructure. They are not accepted into the infrastructure. But they will, uh, you know, a paper straw can't be recycled, uh, or I guess is often not recycled, but at least you, it, it biodegrades. How, how biodegradable? How long uh, do you put it in the ground before it disappears? Well, Dow is in producing those resins, but there are biodegradable plastics available. Again, from our perspective, when you look at biodegradability, biodegradability is not going to solve the plastic pollution issue that we have. We want to focus. We don't well, want to distract. That? Right now, we're recycling nine percent, so it's ninety-one percent irrelevant whether uh, it's a recyclable or a non-recyclable plastic. It's not going to be recycled. Uh, is, what is uh, what tax incentives or whatever could we give for uh, uh, biodegradable plastics? Does anyone have any proposal? Let me move on. Um, we've got these islands of plastic. Uh, in uh, floating in the ocean, mostly plastic. Uh, there, is there any commercial value to that, which, if subsidized, could be used to uh, uh, be uh, chemically recycled? Does anybody have an answer? None of our... Uh, yes. So harvesting a plastic from the ocean would be the problem. Right, that's what I'm... So I mean, it's, it's floating there. Right. Um, so these, but it was so picking it up wouldn't be that. If we if we if we picked it up, what would we do? Would we do anything useful with it? Yes, I I think most of them are PET and. Yeah, I mean certainly if you're able if you are able to harvest it in an economically viable manner, it would probably be like the same plastics we get at materials recovery facilities already. Okay, so these pose a major threat to the environment in the oceans. With the proper incentives, somebody would pick them up. Get some subsidy and 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 use those chemicals for something useful. Potentially, but I think that the 
the engineering challenges of going and harvesting plastics from the ocean are incredible and would certainly need a, a lot of investment to be able to do that at a scale that would actually make a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we find 8.3 billion metric tons of pl plastics produced globally, 6.3 billion becomes plastic waste, 9% is being recycled. Uh, uh, U.S. only recycles 90%. China does 25, Europe does uh, 30, so our nine looks pretty weak. And then you realize some of our nine is really in Chinese landfills. Um, what uh, can the U.S. do uh, to uh, promote uh, recycling internationally? Does anybody have an answer? You want to come in? I'm looking at four witnesses, so, all of whom are I, extremely shy. I, I, I mean, I would say yes. that, um, again, uh, I think the U.S. has the opportunity to lead the way from a technology development perspective to create chemical recycling technologies that will incentivize the reclamation of waste plastics. If we can do that in the United States, likely those technologies would be deployable outside the United States as well, if, they, if the economic incentive is there. Is there any particular technology that you think the U.S. government should be, you know, it's just on the cusp of doing something important but needs some uh, research dollars or, or incentives. Is there any one area of research any of you would recommend? Yes, Mr. Bowen. Yeah, so research in creating new end applications it would be very valuable. Right. One of the problems that's been articulated is that there's not enough end markets for recycle. And so accelerating end market generation would create a home for recycled plastic. My time has expired. Thank you. Um, the chair would like to reclaim five additional minutes for um, questions. Uh, this, is, this is what all of committee looks like, by the way, on the subcommittee for research and technology. Um, I wanted to kind of glom on to something, Dr. Beckham, that you had um, included in your uh, written testimony uh, where you wrote, given the amount of plastics in the food chain, plastics are commonly now found in the human body with potential toxicological effects that are not yet fully understood. And that sentence jumped out at me in a very stark way, in part because I view all of you as the solution delivery vehicles of what we want to do on plastic recycling. You're on the solution end, you're on the problem solving end. You know, we've heard a few comments, it's been couched within your testimony about uh, some of the illegal dumping that's going on, some of the mismanagement, um, the missed opportunities to reuse, reduce, and uh, recycle. But I was just wondering if you could kind of help me understand how we could understand these toxicological effects, given that you are testifying before uh, a House panel today. I'm, I, I, will, I will note that I'm not a toxicologist, so um, with, with, uh, but with that caveat, um, I think certainly there, are, uh, there is a large research community that does tox toxicology and thinking about, uh, there was a, for example, there was a paper published a couple weeks ago where they measured uh, micro and sort of nanoplastics in the air and found even in pristine environments that you can breathe this stuff in. How that affects the human body, how that affects animal life in general, I think is still very poorly understood. And from my perspective, I think that federal research dollars could be put into the toxicology, toxicology community, uh, research community, to understand those types of things. Because that we don't know. We simply don't know what, that, what the effects of those will be. We, we find ourselves with a plastic paradox. Okay, I, I wanted to capture that for the record. And at this time, I would like to excuse my distinguished colleague, Ranking Member Jim Braird, um, who has a, an appointment to make. Uh, obviously, this has been a robust um, hearing, and we've heard many rounds. I'm going to yield back the remainder of my time. That concludes. Um, Oh, Mr. Sherman has another one. Do you want to go again, Brad? I was just going to ask. You can go again. Go ahead. I'm going to see. I'm going to cede five more minutes to my distinguished colleague, Mr. Brad Sherman, who I am so glad joined us today. By the way, this is the full research and tech subcommittee in action. Thank you. Go ahead, okay. Brad. Uh, it's been over 40 years since the last federal law to promote national research and development program for improving methods of collection. Uh, 
and recycling of uh, solid waste. The law was a national effort uh, to recover valuable petroleum-based resources that were filling our landfills. It sounds like a lot of what we're facing today, uh, except that the, purport the volumes are exponentially larger and the types of plastics are different. Uh, we need to find the right balance between the federal government having a mandate in states and localities doing it their own way. Um, what do you uh, gentlemen feel is the, uh, uh, the federal role uh, here, uh, both in research and in mandating uh, procedures at the state and local level? I'll go up straight down, uh, Mr. South. Well, I think you bring out a very valid point. Just in looking at our own statistics for the city of Plymouth, we've seen our materials that we've landfilled from 1992 go up from 1,648 tons to, uh, in 2018, to 2,400 tons. Uh, but our recycling um, has also um, gone uh, up a, a little bit during that period of time. So I think uh, government, if the government is going to be involved in things, there has to be a national standard of what's acceptable. And I think from that, then industry can uh, move forward from, from there, at least on the collection uh, standpoint. I agree with you on your uh, plastic bottle uh, there that you uh, bring with you. Um, in our case, we've got about 30 employees in our city hall. Um, one of our employees had the suggestion that we replace the drinking fountain uh, with one where you can fill up your bottle. Uh, in just over a year, we filled up over 6,000 bottles. Mr. Sherman, thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, the earth is our home, and charity begins at home. Not every industry is profitable from the get-go. Sometimes governments have to intervene and help start industry. This in particular may be true when you're talking about pl ocean uh, plastics. It may not be profitable. Uh, it, there, there's no way to foresee how technology changes and see how if things would be done differently in the future. But as of now, if we have to clean up the oceans, we have to pay the price. It is where we live. So the burden falls on us, on all of us, to, to help industry in, in cleaning up the planet. Thank you. So I, I will echo those sentiments very strongly. I think the, one of the roles of the federal government is to support uh, research that will allow for revolutionary changes and step changes in the way that we deal with today's plastics as well as redesign tomorrow's plastics. And that kind of fundamental research I think will be really critical for, again, enabling a new industry in the United States using chemical recycling. Yes, thank you for the question. I would answer your question uh, echoing my comments earlier about definitions. The federal government can help with definitions around what recycling is. This will be important as, again, advanced recycling technology is brought uh, to the forefront. Two, I would say uh, recycling certification, meaning that these advanced recycling systems that we're talking about are depolymerizing the product, putting it back into the front end of the polymer manufacturing process. So we want to be able to certify what was recycled and then give those certifications to our customer so the customers so that they can feel confident that they're purchasing recycled material, much like, say, wind energy as an example. Uh, and lastly, I would say the federal government can help in piloting programs. There's a lot of work being done at looking at new, again, end market applications for recycled plastic. And so the government can help with piloting these programs to bring them to scale. Dow, as an example, is doing work with using recycled materials in roads. Uh, and other durable applications like that. I yield back. Before we bring this uh, hearing to a close, I, we obviously want to thank our distinguished witnesses again for testifying before us uh, on the committee today. I, I think you answered the, the tough questions as best as you could. You, you gave us some things to, to think about. Um, I, I believe that we're going to meet the, the charge of this time. Uh, I believe that there is a railing call. I, I represent a district in, in, in Michigan surrounded by freshwater lakes. I'm in a state surrounded by freshwater lakes. And as people hear the alarming statistics around the 
uh, equivalent of a, uh, a trash uh, can, or excuse me, it's a, a dispensary of trash being dumped into the ocean per minute. That's alarming, going into the, the farthest trenches of our ocean and seeing that there's plastic waste there. That's not a result that any of us necessarily want to leave. But that's why I think we call it a plastic paradox, because plastic has improved our lives. It has made it so that we can have food security and food delivered throughout our country and into the mouths of people and medical advancements. But we've got to ask ourselves where and how we are going to meet this charge. Does it fully fall on the consumer? I believe our individuals who want to step up and participate in recycling programs and find uh, an altruistic value in doing so because they should and because they have a municipality that enables them uh, to do that. Uh, we have industry and public-private partnerships. We've got certainly great expertise that's researching this and understanding the chemical compounds, but we know we need to do better. And so we can turn to our, our colleagues throughout federal government and an all of interagency approach to meeting the, the technological considerations. I think, Mr. Boven, we'd certainly like to continue to hear from you on the work that you are doing on the corporate side, but as it matches with what the National Institute of Standards and Technologies is hopefully going to bring forward, and we will continue to partner with you and support you. I will say $3.2 million with Dr. Menon goes a long way. Um, the record on this uh, uh, hearing will remain open for, for two weeks uh, for additional statements from members and for any other additional questions that the committee may ask of our witnesses. At this time, our witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned.